So welcome everybody today okay. to our next shadowing session. Today we are honored to be hosting Dr. Myra Pizet, who is a Lebanese veterinarian um, and the founder of Dr. Pa. Welcome, Dr. Tabet. Hi, thank you guys. So I just wanted to thank all of you. I actually just met all of the group from pre-health or part of the group of pre-health shadowing. And what's amazing is that you guys are so young and it's so exciting to see such a young group of young people so excited and so driven by this. So really this fills my heart and I'm like super impressed by you guys. So it's amazing. Let me know when you, do you want me to start the PowerPoint right away? Okay. Yes, you can go ahead and pull it up. So, okay. 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 So, let's let you. Let me just move this. Okay. So, basically, uh, just a few points that this is a PowerPoint that I did myself. All the cases which are presented are my own. These are cases that I have seen in my own clinic at Dr. Pa. Of course, this is a free webinar, which we're lucky to have had organized by pre-health shadowing. Some pictures are gonna be a bit rough on some of you. So I will tell you ahead of time to make sure because some people it's maybe too much for them and it's too disturbing, nothing too much, don't worry, but just it's, I should tell you that. And of course, the biggest thanks is for pre-health shadowing group for organizing this webinar, which I think is gonna be super helpful for a lot of people. So how did it all begin? So to start with, this is uh, Ted, he's a patient of mine. He's the cutest dog. He has actually an Instagram page as well. So basically, ever since I was eight years old, I've always had dogs with me um, as a young child. They were my best friends. Uh, at the age of eight, I had the, my first dog ever. Her name was Gypsy. There was not a lot of bond. I was actually scared of her. I remember the first time I met Gypsy. She was running towards me and I got super scared and I did not like her. And then bit by bit, we started being friends. And the moment I started getting close to her, my cousin was walking her in the mountains and they actually thought that she's a wolf and they shot her. So this was kind of a shock to me, but it wasn't that much of a shock because I was not very attached to her. Like it was just the first couple of weeks. So it was okay. And then we went, We brought another dog whose name was Max. Max was actually my biggest friend ever. He was my best friend. I used to sleep under the balcony with him, whether it was raining, uh, whether it was snowing. He was literally my best friend for three years. And then one day we forgot the gate open, the garden gate open and he ran up the hill and he came back and he was poisoned. And I still remember till today um, when he came back and he was shivering and vomiting and I was screaming like, like a maniac. And he died within five minutes in front of me. And it was very shocking to me and uh, very hard for me. And um, this is when I decided that I want to be a vet and I want to save as many pets as I can. And I think this is where uh, the difference lies between what I went through and what maybe other vets went through is that my pets are my best friend. They still are till today. And my motive is to try and save as many as I can. And this is why through my Insta account, through my clinic, through the webinars, I always try to spread awareness about poisoning, about how to make sure that your pet is as healthy as possible. And as harsh as it is, uh, I think Max is my biggest, um, is my biggest motivation. And every time I have a dog who walks into the clinic poisoned, I remember him and I'm like full focus and I give my best. I'm like a machine when a dog, like I'm always very, 
active and very strict when someone comes with an emergency, but especially in the case of poisoning, it's like, tuck, 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 tuck. it's very strict, it's very rigid because I'm always doing my best to save them. So that's that. My personal experience and how I became a vet. So I had three years in AUB, American University of Beirut, where I studied my BS in veterinary science. And then I moved on to Budapest in Hungary, where I did my DVM uh, in St. Istvan, which is one of the best schools in Europe. It was kind of tough, but it was worth it. And then when I came back, I worked for four years in one of the biggest hospitals in Lebanon, during which I decided that I'm going to start by working towards opening my own clinic because opening your own clinic is very exciting, but it's also very harsh. And it's you're not only handling the patients, you're also handling the business part. And this is something that no one tells you when did you decide to open a, your own business. It's always like butterflies and you're going to be independent and it's going to be super nice. But there's also the business part that we're going to be talking about as well. Uh, I also, so while I was working in the hospital, I was also doing my PhD. So two years after I started work, I started my PhD as well. So basically at one point for two years, I was working full-time job as a vet. I was studying for my PhD and I was looking for places to open my own clinic. I finally finished my PhD in January, which was amazing. And of course, when you decide to be a vet, this is a lifelong continuous learning. So it's never ending. I'm always learning and this is how it should be. If you decide to become a vet, you should know that you're gonna be learning all of your life. It's never gonna stop. These are pictures that I simply adore because they are actually the, my biggest and my proudest moment. So the first one, this one is with my parents at St. Ichvan when I got my DVM, Doctor in Veterinary Medicine in Budapest. This one is when I opened my clinic. My dad, I think, I don't think my dad is my biggest support. Without him, I wouldn't have gotten anywhere. So he's always with me. He's my backbone in everything. And this is my sister, my sister, my sister. They were super proud of me as well. And then this one is the latest, which is in January when I finally got my PhD. I was also super excited about that. So at these moments, I always remind myself whenever I'm having a hard time and whenever I think, for example, during the pandemic, I think everyone is having a very high, hard time. I always remind myself that I kind of already achieved what I had put my head into since I was 10 years old. I decided I'm going to become a vet, open up my own clinic and do my PhD. So this makes me feel really proud. So. What does my job consist of? When I say I'm a vet, it's basically that whenever you have a dog who's sick, you're gonna be bringing him in into the clinic. I'm gonna be diagnosing and treating the sick animals. So this is uh, one of the biggest and hardest part of being a vet is the diagnosis because dogs and cats cannot explain to you what's going on and what's wrong. So the diagnosis part is very hard to be able to actually figure out what's wrong and treating them. Then uh, something that people do not know is that as a vet, you're actually protecting the public from diseases which can be transmitted from animals. These are known as zoonotic diseases. We have a lot of zoonotic diseases, rabies, influenza, all of these. So this is a very important part, which we're gonna be talking about as well. And then I should always make sure that animals which are used for food consumption are disease free. And this is also called food hygiene. So this is a different part. It's uh, so when you're a vet, you can choose several pattern, uh, several path that you want to follow. You can either do what I did and be a small animal vet where you're going to be treating dogs and cats mainly. You can be a large animal vet where you're going to be treating cows and goats and farm animals, basically. You can be an exotic animal vet where you're gonna be treating exotic animals. 
And uh, you can also do uh, go into public health and you're gonna be testing the meat and the chicken and make sure that they are free from any diseases. As a vet, I'm a general practitioner. So your dog comes in, I check him, I do a full checkup, I make sure he's okay. I give him a deworming, I give him an antifreeze, I give him a vaccine and everything that a GP would actually be doing. I'm also a dermatologist. So any skin issue that your fur baby is gonna be having, I'm gonna be the one treating it. So you should always, you should also know, so, uh, you should also know the basic of skin diseases in dogs and cats. This is my favorite part, I'm a surgeon. So surgery is a big part of what we do. Basically, I think the most common surgery we do in Lebanon, and I'm pretty sure everywhere around the world is the spaying. So I love surgery, I think it's very exciting. And uh, it's a big part of being a vet, spaying, neutering, uh, removing uh, bladder stones, removing kidney stones, uh, removing cancer, all of this is part of being a surgeon and I simply love it. I'm also a cardiologist. So of course, after being a vet, you can go into specialization and do some uh, further studies and become more specialized, whether be it cardiology, uh, dermatology or anything. But as a vet, you need to have the basic. So I could tell you if something is wrong with your dog simply by listening through the stethoscope. But in order for me to accurately diagnose what's going on, I would refer you to a cardiologist who would do an echocardiography for us to be able to detect what exactly is going on with your dog. Uh, I'm also an anesthesiologist. I think this is the part that I least like. I personally least like, some people love it. So basically anesthesia, uh, you're gonna have to make sure that before going into any surgery, when you're going to be putting your dog or your cat under anesthesia, that he's fully healthy, that he doesn't have any health issues. You need to see which type of anesthesia to use, the dosage. So you're literally doing the job of an anesthesiologist. In more complicated surgery, you actually bring in with you on the surgery an anesthesiologist. So whenever, so for routine surgeries, we don't usually, so I usually put them under and then I have an assistant, a nurse who helps me and monitor the anesthesia. But in more complicated surgeries, like spinal cord surgeries, like orthopedics, all of these surgery, which usually take up more time, then I actually bring an anesthesiologist who's a colleague of mine for her to make sure that everything is under control control because as everyone knows and in case you don't the longer the surgery is the more we need to make sure that we're monitoring more closely uh, the anesthesia and finally you also need to be a radiologist uh, x-rays help us detect a lot of uh, diseases they are a must when you have a fracture and they can give us a lot of insight if you have what's known as a blocked cat for example which means that you have a cat who is unable to pee. So you would see that the urinary bladder is very enlarged. You can see urinary bladder stone. You can see even sometimes uh, foreign bodies, uh, gases. So x-rays can help a lot with our diagnosis and it's very empirical for us to be able to, read, to accurately read uh, the x-rays. Uh, we should also be able to read CT scan and MRI However, because we don't get too many, too much practice, usually we always refer to uh, someone else to be able to read for us the MRI or the CT scan. So what are the risks of being a vet? Because every, um, every job that we have has risk. So the most common one is that you're gonna be bitten or you're gonna be kicked by a frightened animal. There's a joke that we used to have in university that you need to be bitten more than 20 times before you graduate as a vet. And trust me, you're gonna be bitten much more than that. So yeah, so you're gonna be bitten quite a lot. In the beginning, it's gonna be because you're inexperienced. And then as you mature and as you grow, it's more because most of the time your patients do not listen to you 
and they actually freak out and they let go of their dog or their cat and then you get bitten. But with uh, as you mature, the numbers decrease. Like I can't even remember the last time that I got bitten. So whereas my first year, I can tell you I was being bitten every week or every 10 days. You're also gonna be kicked by a frightened animal. This is most common with large animal vets. So you're gonna be kicked by a horse, you're gonna be kicked by a donkey, by a cow. So, and being kicked by a horse is uh, really hurtful. So you need to make sure to know that this is one of the risks. Uh, you can get infected with diseases. Whenever you have a sick animal who comes in and you're still not sure what he has, as we already said, there is a risk that some diseases are transmitted from animals to humans and vice versa. So there's always this risk. This is why you should take your precautions. You can, when you're gonna be exposed to x-rays, of course, we're wearing the suit, we're wearing the gloves, we're wearing the thyroid protector when we're doing x-rays, but you're still getting exposed to x-rays. And unfortunately, not all of the clinics are taking all of the safety measures. So this is one, uh, one of the risks which can be decreased with time. And of course, there's the risk that you're gonna be puncturing yourself accidentally with needles, whether that is because the dog or the cat is really hyper and while you're trying to give him the needle, you puncture yourself, or, and I think this is the one which is most common, while you're closing the needle, you might puncture yourself. I remember in my first year as a vet, you know, when you're starting, you're super excited. I had a cat with hepatitis and hepatitis is quite common, but not that much with cats. And there is a viral hepatitis, which can be transmitted to humans as well. So you need to be really careful with that. And I remember that I had treated the cat, I had given him IV, everything was okay. And I was super happy because he was a very aggressive cat that he did not bite me and that I was safe. And while I was closing the needle that I had just injected him with, I remember puncturing myself. And I think this, is, this was when I was really scared because I'm like, shit, I might get hepatitis. So this is why actually we're always uh, recommended to, I personally recommend to do regular yearly blood tests for ourselves to make sure that we are always healthy and that nothing is going underdiagnosed because we're always exposed to, this, to these risks. What are your job opportunities as a vet? The first opportunity is that you can work in a clinic. This is the best opportunity in my personal opinion, having my own clinic, having my own staff, having my own grooming area, my own surgical uh, room with my own team is something that I simply love. And this is why I put it as a first option. You can also be working in a farm, be it a poultry farm, a goat farm, a cow farm. Uh, I have a colleague of mine who's simply in love with going into the farm. So it depends where you see yourself more. You can also be working with the government. We've already spoken about this. So you can have what's known as food safety. Free from any diseases. And also you can work for within a farm, for example, to make sure that um, the animals uh, who are being killed for human consumption are actually free of diseases. And this is something which is new that you can train dogs for bomb detection. And also recently you can train dogs for, to detect like COVID. So this is something that as a vet you can do and also as a behaviorist or as a trainer. I'm gonna be talking about two cases that uh, were actually uh, presented to me. And uh, so uh, some of the pictures in the first case are a bit harsh in case after this slide, I'm gonna be showing the pictures in case you want to skip this part. So I had a dog who's four years old who was rescued by an NGO. He was presented with me completely lethargic. So uh, lethargy means that the dog is really, really tired, unable to walk. Um, so this is what we know, what we call lethargy. 
inappetence and he had some skin issues, some very, very severe skin issues. So remember, as a vet, I need to be a dermatologist, but not a specialized dermatologist. So Magnum could barely stand on his feet and actually had to be hospitalized. So he basically was hospitalized for a week or so, if I remember correctly. He actually took um, IV. Uh, we, he was taking antibiotics because he has irritation and he had secondary bacterial infection. And we were trying to figure out what's wrong with him. So I'm gonna show you the pictures now. So this is Magnum. Uh, the picture is harsh and in reality, it was even harsher. So as you can see, uh, literally he was skin and bones. He couldn't stand up. He was always lying. Um, he had crusts all over his body uh, and he was completely dehydrated. So following further testing, uh, this picture was taken, I think two to three months ago and following testing and after bringing on a colleague of mine who's a dermatologist and who's a specialist and doing a biopsy. Okay, let me check what happened. Okay, I'm back. Okay, sorry about that. So after uh, checking and having a dermatologist on board with us, we did a biopsy and we discovered that Magnum has something known as leishmaniosis. So leishmaniosis is a pretty severe uh, skin disease that he can get. He is currently being treated. I actually wanted to put you a picture of him because he's starting to improve, but we still could not take any picture because we still actually, the medicine is pretty expensive and we can't find it in Lebanon but we're gonna be getting it from abroad and the NGO are working around the clock to get him the medicine. So this is one of those cases where you can't immediately find out what's wrong with the dog, where you can get frustrated because you really wanna help him because his eyes say it all and he was literally crying for our help. And I was super happy when we find out what was wrong because I knew that once you have an accurate diagnosis, then from this moment onward, you can move on with the treatment. In this specific case, the treatment is quite costly and is unavailable in Lebanon, but the NGO are pretty persistent and I'm sure that we're gonna be able to get him the medicine. So hopefully within a couple of weeks, he's gonna be better and I can update you guys in case someone wants more updates on him. The second case is a very, dear case to my heart because I actually had a kitten who was presented to the clinic paralyzed. So complete paralysis. He couldn't move. He could only move his uh, front limbs, his back limbs. He couldn't, he couldn't, uh, he was fully aware. So he would look at you, he would listen, he would eat. He was active. So imagine a kitten trying to run and unable to run. He couldn't walk, he couldn't pee, he couldn't poo. The first week was very hard because every time he needed to pee, he couldn't. So we had to make him pee by actually manually pressing and removing it. Or if it was too much, then we had to give him a sort of a sedative and then aspirate them, which was quite hard and traumatizing to him. The owners could not afford the treatment, so they wanted to put him down. Uh, so this, in this specific case, the owner actually paid for an MRI because we needed to know what was wrong. Uh, once we did the MRI, we discovered that we had an infection in the spinal cord. Um, because this is quite a costly treatment, the owners did not want to treat and had uh, asked me to put him down and euthanize him. We get a lot of cases, so it's pretty common for us that when an owner cannot afford doing any treatment that we put him under. In this specific case, I did not. And I decided to take on the case and save him. And so this is what happened. So this is, this is the guy. Uh, this was uh, 10 days after the first, uh, after the treatment that he was receiving. 
uh, in the beginning, he couldn't even uh, lift his front paws. And then eventually he could. And I was starting to become hopeful because I had decided to start to do a trial for two weeks and see how he was doing. So when he actually lifted himself up a bit is when I had hope that this kitten actually might survive. And then I'm going to show you the next. So this was when he started improving. He's starting to use his paws, his back legs. And we are so happy. This is Joanna, my assistant. This was two weeks or three weeks post treatment where he walked. He literally walked. So I remember being super excited about that because he was literally walking. And I knew that from that moment onward that we saved him and we had, um, literally, we saved him. <laughs> and this was him with me walking, having the time of his life and simply enjoying a day out and we saved him and I adopted him. So I put him up for adoption. Uh, someone took him in for a week, um, traumatized him actually. They did, what want, they did not want him anymore. So I asked her to bring him back and now he's part of my family and I have three rescued and this is the latest edition. So this one is Elvis. And that's it. So this is Chinjin, my cat as well. And this is Kusa. Both of them are rescued cats. I always encourage rescuing. I'm not against anyone. I respect anyone who decides to get a specific type or breed and buying, but I'm one, I'm a person who's an advocate of rescuing and all of my cats and dogs are also rescued. So that's it basically. Thank you so much, Dr. Tavet. These are great cases that you presented. Um, we did have a couple of questions on the first case. What was the name of the skin condition that uh, the doc presented with? Leishmaniosis. So basically, uh, in the beginning, he was misdiagnosed uh, because like, you know, uh, having such a complicated case, you can't immediately find out what's going on. So we had several vets working for his case. And this is basically leishmaniosis, which is basically a parasite, which is transmitted by a small biting sand fly. And uh, it can cause a lot of diseases and it can also uh, infect humans. Uh, so you cannot, you cannot actually get infected with leishmaniosis from your dog or your cat, but dogs can get infected with the sand fly. So this is why it's very important that we always put anti fleas on our dogs and cats. And usually it is uh, curable, but the prognosis is low. And the treatment, as I already said, is very costly. So if someone wants to see, this is a typical leishmaniosis, how it presents. And on the skin as well, on the nose, on the eyes, it's typical of leishmaniosis. Um, and then for the second case, there was a question regarding um, if you have to sedate animals for an MRI. Yes, you always have to sedate an animal when you're doing an MRI, because during an MRI, you need to be still for the image to become uh, to become clear. Sometimes we give, so in this case, because he was barely two months old, it was a very mild sedative and not a complete anesthesia. MRIs usually take between 10 to 15 minutes, so you don't need to put the animal completely under. So we usually give a mild sedative. It's easier for him to wake up. It's less stress on us as uh, we give the anesthesia and it's also less costly. So it's a win-win situation for everyone. Thanks. Um, and then following that, um, can you go into a little bit more about how the kitten overcame paralysis? What was the treatment actually like? 
Yeah, so basically we had an inflammation in the spinal cord, which was treated with different kinds of antibiotics. In case someone wants exactly what was given with the exact dosage, I can go back to his file and let you know exactly what was given. And he took that for uh, 20 days approximately. We started seeing the improvement from the uh, first week onward. And then at the end of the second week, we had approximately complete recovery, but we didn't want to stop the treatment. And then on the third week, we stopped the treatment and he was okay completely. Thanks. Um, and then there is another question. If, oh, if you could talk a little bit about how you detach yourself from your patients. Um, I mean, like, mm. Uh, I don't actually <laughs> I think I should but I don't so as a vet you can't but get attached to your patients I actually know 90% of my patients I know their history I know because I'm a small clinic and because we're uh, not that many and because it's not a huge hospital where you're getting 200 case every day so it's basically 10 20 case per day so for a dog or a cat who's been with me for a year or more i actually know him i know his parents i know his siblings in case they have other pets and i don't think you can detach yourself from your patients i should try harder but i don't however when something really bad happens, when, for example, I lose a patient of mine and I have another patient that I need to see, I can detach myself in the moment. So, for example, I've had a case a couple of weeks back, a cat that I'm really attached to who died very suddenly and um, he died midday approximately and I had surgeries to do. So I did not allow myself to... Uh, to crash. I did not allow myself to cry. I simply moved on and I did the surgeries. And then after I came back home, I let it go and I was crying my eyes out and I was talking to his parents and I was like trying to see how they're doing. So I don't think as a vet, you can completely detach yourself because we're doing because being a vet means that you care about the animals and eventually if you care you're gonna get attached to them especially if these are long-term patients so i have patients who's been who have been with me ever since i started being a vet so six years ago so you can detach yourself from a pet who's been with you for six years but you can learn to manage your emotions in order for you to be able to save other animals and then move on a really great reflection on the balance that it takes to be a vet for sure. Um, going back to the uh, second case, if you could talk a bit more about what was the cause of the spinal cord inflammation and if there was any vaccines that could have been given to avoid this in the first place. Okay, so because the cat was actually found by someone, we did not know exactly what was wrong. When she first got him in, I thought that he was hit because most case of paralysis that we see, especially this type of paralysis, so hind leg paralysis is due to a cat either who fell down or he was hit by something on his back. In this case, it was neither. It was actually an infection, which is something that you can get because you have a low immunity system. So most probably this cat was not uh, did not receive enough colostrum and milk from his mother so he did not receive enough immunity which led to him being uh, catching this uh, uh, virus this uh, infection and no this uh, this would not have been avoided if he had gotten a vaccine because vaccines for cats do not have any effect on the spinal cord so the vaccines that we do are actually in order to prevent viral infection and this was not the case Interesting, yeah. Um, off of that, is there any, um, can you talk a bit more about like dog allergies? Um, if there are any food allergies or unknown allergies that cause itching that might have uh, led to that parasite mm -hmm. being infected? Yeah. 
So one of the most common issues that we have as vets are allergies, be it food allergy or environmental allergies. Allergies are very often underdiagnosed. So a lot of times we have allergies which go underdiagnosed and because most vets would not be able to accurately diagnose that this is caused by an allergy and because allergies lead to so when you have an allergy, you're going to have pruritus, and then you're going to have the dog or the cat who's going to be scratching himself. And if the scratching continues for a while, then you're going to have secondary bacterial infection. So most of the time, uh, we're treating the symptoms and we're not treating the cause of it. Hence why there are several tests that can be, do, that can be done, be it the intradermal allergy testing, where you're going to be injecting into your dog's skin some allergen and see if there's a reaction in order to detect what's causing the allergy. Or you can do some blood tests, which can also help detect the allergies. It's very important to accurately diagnose the cause of the allergy and then treat it and not simply treat the symptoms. I have patients who have had dogs and cats on prednisone or any other sort of cortisone, uh, which is a medicine which suppresses the immunity system and basically does not let your dog or cat scratch anymore for years uh, without accurately diagnosing what the cause of it is. And this is very bad because prednisone has a lot of side effects and you're not actually treating the cause of it, you're simply treating the symptoms. So it's very important for me to be able to identify the cause of the allergy and then treat it while alleviating the symptoms, which are the itching, the pruritus, the reddening, and all of these. Thanks for such a thorough answer, wow. Um, if you could talk a bit more about uh, how you pursued your PhD, what advice you would give to someone who wants to pursue a PhD? Um, is it, is your, what is your PhD focused on a specific area um, and interest in science? Okay, so I think uh, I've always wanted to become, to do a PhD because I've, I've, I always like to teach people. I always like to inform people. I think uh, giving out information is really nice. Spreading awareness is really nice. So this was the main reason why I wanted to do my PhD in order for me to be eligible uh, to becoming a teacher in any university that I wish. And it was also my safety net back then. So remember, I started doing my PhD during my second year as a vet. Back then, I was not sure if I was capable of handling my own clinic. So for me, it was also a safety net where I was like, okay, in case I was not capable of opening my own clinic, then at least I will be able to teach. Uh, in Lebanon, uh, doing a PhD as a vet is not very common. So I was kind of restricted with uh, as to where I could do it and with whom I can do it and the area of expertise that I could do. So I was capable of doing it with a doctor who's actually a doctor in agriculture. And because he's an agricultural doctor, uh, he works with large animals. So basically cows, goats, these types of animals and not small animals, which was pretty exciting for me because I'm kind of an expert with dogs and cats now. So it was good for me to learn more about cows and goats. And my topic was about energy expenditure in goats uh, and how to actually try and decrease them. So I worked with goats and they are the loveliest uh, animals. You have no idea, goats are amazing. So for three years, I was actually working with goats and um, I, can actually, I can also give you, if someone wants to read a bit, uh, it was pretty interesting because we did some genetic works on goats in Lebanon, which was the first time ever that something like this is done on Lebanon. We also did some field work and we did some nutrition about the plants that the goats were eating. So it's a pretty big project which was done and I'm super proud that we were able to do it. And yeah, uh, doing a PhD is super harsh. It's uh, super time consuming. It's super stressful. I don't think anyone tells you how hard it is to write your thesis and to get your article accepted, but you can, you can do it. Once you set your mind to something, you can do it. 
Going off of that, there were some follow-up questions of how long on average does it take to complete a PhD and what qualities, in your opinion, do students need to succeed in completing a PhD? Um, depends on which university you go into. So in my university, the minimum is three years, the maximum is five years. So you get between three to five years to complete it. You need to have um, uh, around, I don't remember how many credits, but you need to take a certain amount of courses. In my case, it was a co one course every semester. You have six semesters, which was pretty okay. So it was two weeks every semester that you need to attend classes in university. Other universities are a bit more loose. So I know some university where you can have up to seven or 10 years for you to be able to complete your PhD. I don't think having this long time is something good because if you extend it over that longer period, then I think you're gonna get to, you're gonna let go and you're not gonna finish it. I finished it in four years. I think four years is the average, especially that I was working full time and I opened up my clinic during this, these four years as well. If someone wants to do a PhD, the first thing that they need to ask themselves is why am I doing a PhD? If I really wanna do a PhD, I would highly recommend uh, for everyone who wants to do a PhD to see, um, to have a topic that they really like, because if you don't like the topic that you're working with, working on the same subject for four years and you not liking it is something really hard. You need to make sure that your tutor is someone who's gonna be pushing you, who's gonna be helpful. Um, I was lucky that my tutor was helpful. I have friends of mine who have very bad tutors and it's really hard to do a PhD on your own. And lastly, you should make sure that you like writing because you're gonna write your PhD at least 20 times and you're gonna change it so many times that if you don't like writing, it's a big issue for you. So find why you're doing your PhD and if you're convinced and you have four years, you know that you're gonna be committed for four years, then definitely go for it. Thank you for the helpful advice. Um... Going off of that, um, could you talk a little bit more about why you decided to become a vet? What's veterinarian school like and any advice specifically for Lebanese vet students? So as I said, the reason why I became a vet is Max, my dog who passed away in front of my eyes. And I decided from that moment on that I'm gonna save as many pets as I can. I also had two other dogs who were misdiagnosed by vets and this also reinforced my decision where I was like, okay, you know what? There are too many butchers here that someone needs to step up and become a vet and help as many pets as you can. Hence why I decided to become a vet in Lebanon. As a Lebanese student, it's actually a bit hard to become a vet because as you see, I studied abroad to becoming a vet. So in Lebanon, there's only one university, which is the Lebanese university to becoming a vet. I know that uh, it's a great university. However, you don't have enough uh, hands-on and enough practice. So in case you do decide to become a vet and learn in uh, the Lebanese university, then I would advise students to do as many rotation as they can to go into several clinics, several hospitals, uh, do a lot of procedures, ask a lot of questions so that they can learn because you're going to be learning much more with on hand than what you're going to be learning in school and at university. Uh, if you could talk a little bit more of any hardships you overcame throughout your education. I know before the session we were talking about just the difficulties as a Lebanese student, but also just as a vet student in general, there's tons of um, hardships that come with that. Um, yeah, I was, yeah, I was actually telling you guys that, uh, so for me, uh, my first hardship is that I had finished my three years in AUB. I was supposed to go into my fourth years immediately in Budapest because there was a memorandum of understanding between AUB and St. Istvan, where I would do three years in AUB and then continue my fourth, fifth and sixth years in Budapest. So unfortunately, the programs were not really correct. 
And when I first arrived to Budapest, I was shocked in knowing that everything that I had done back at my university was not going to be taken completely into account and that I needed to start everything from scratch. So basically, I did my first and second year of TDM together, so joint, and then my third and fourth year also together. This is where it was very hard. So the first and second year was kind of okay because, you know, the first three years in vet are kind of general knowledge, biology, biochemistry, pathology, all of this. And then starting the third year, it gets really into the medical part, the anatomy, the physiology, and all of these very bulky and heavy subjects that we need to learn. So this is where I was waking up at 3 a.m. in the morning and studying 14, 15 hours hours a day in order for me to be able to catch up onto everything that I have missed. And then um, when I finished, finally, uh, I came back to Lebanon and also I had a lot of time finding a lot of hardship into finding like the accurate and uh, correct hospital for me and because there is so much, there's so much competition in Lebanon. Uh, I was, the first six months I was working uh, kind of for nothing in return, just for free in order for me to learn. And then for a year I was, until I got my degree, um, uh, how do you say it? So equalized in Lebanon, I was getting paid half of my salary and then I started making kind of money. So overall it was quite hard but it's okay it's where it got, it's has gotten me where i am now so i think where whatever you're gonna do you're gonna have hardship it's just that you need to focus on your goal and always look at it my first year in budapest was very harsh because i wasn't sure that i could make it and because I knew that everything that I had studied before is not gonna be taken into account. So it was really hard for me to accept this, that all of my efforts were gone to waste. And then once I, for, after my first semester, I decided that this is what I really want to do. I've been dreaming of becoming a vet for ever since I was eight years old. So once you start focusing on your goal, um, the hardship kind of falls into something that you have to overcome and that's it, so okay. First obstacle, fine. Second obstacle, fine. And this is uh, this is what you, what helped me a lot. Always remembering my goal. Always saying, okay, so one day less and one day closer to my goal. And um, eventually, I made it. That was really great advice. Um, next question is also on the same topic of hardship. Does it get any easier to perform euthanasia on animals? Um, if you could talk a little bit about like what goes through your head Oof. when you have to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think um, we have two schools when it comes to this specific question. Some people are for euthanasia, others are against. Both choices are correct and there's no judgment when it comes to any choice. I'm someone who's for euthanasia. I think that at a point where medicine has reached its limit and where we can't help anymore the suffering of an animal and where I see an animal suffering in front of my eyes, I decide to end the, suffer, the suffering. I think this is a blessing that we have. Some people think that it is not our choice as vets to decide if we can end someone's life. So this is debatable and again, uh, both choices are correct and no one is doing anything wrong. So it just depends on where you stand. Does it get any easier? No, never. Um, every time, thankfully, uh, because medicine is improving, euthanasia rates are decreasing. So we're not performing. So if I compare how many euthanasia I'm doing now compared to my first year, we're doing much less. And this is because of the improvement in medicine that we're having, but it's, uh, it never gets easier. It's always harder, especially now with the pandemic, it's even harder because I already spoke about how I can detach myself from my patients. So with the pandemic, if we're gonna have 
a dog or a cat who's going to be euthanized. It's basically going to be me and the dog doing the whole procedure alone and then giving the dog or the cat to their owners because they're not allowed to go in. So basically, because we're taking safety measures, everyone is staying at the door with their mask on. I'm the one who's bringing in the dog, making sure that there's no, like uh, we're disinfecting the leash and everything. So now it's even harsher because we have the safety regulation. It's even harsher because when I deliver the dog or the cat dead, I can't show sympathy. I can't hug my patients. I can't, I try to express to them, but having the mask on and the face shield does not let people see your facial expression as well. So I feel having to do an euthanasia nowadays is even harsher, but it's one of those parts of the job that you have to do, which are harsh, but you have to do it and someone has to do it, so. Thanks for sharing. It certainly is a difficult decision to make. And it was really, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, someone asked earlier if there was any advice for getting experience during the pandemic, um, because most of the opportunities now are for in-person are more limited, if there was any um, experiences that you know of during COVID? You mean if there's any, like, is this a vet student who's asking how I they should so. do? Your... Okay. So unfortunately, for example, in my clinic uh, today, I'm not taking any interns. I'm not taking any students for their own safety and for my own safety. So what's harsh during the pandemic is that you can't get too much practicals done and you can't actually see. What I do recommend, however, is that because for every hardship, you always have a silver lining. Uh, there are a lot of free courses which are being done. This is, the, this is one of the examples. So this webinar is done for free. So any student out there should be joining uh, webinars a lot because try to learn as much as you can. Whenever you're gonna be doing anything practical, you should learn the theoretical part very, very well. So for example, the simplest surgery, which is the spaying, you're gonna have to learn the step-by-step -step what you should do. You need to memorize them. You need to know of any difficulties that you might encounter and how to solve them before being capable of joining and scrubbing in on a surgery. So because you can't scrub in nowadays, what you can do is, is you can memorize it and do it. And you can do that with another friend of yours or with another colleague. So you can quiz yourself with each other. And I think having all of these free information and free webinars helps a lot. So take advantage of this at least. Hopefully COVID will be long gone within a year and then you can apply what you learned. That's really excellent advice about taking opportunity of our silver lining now. Um, Another question we had was uh, if you ever had to deal with a pet who's been abused and how um, how do you deal with the owner of that abused pet? Oh boy, yeah, I did, I still do. It still gets me, it's one of those cases where I'm really, really angry. Actually, uh, last week alone, I had a beautiful lab who came in so the owner was super proud. His dog is super hyper. First thing is he has a choke chain. For those of you who do not know, a choke chain is a, a choke chain and a prong collar together. So basically a choke chain is a chain that when you pull, it gets tighter on the neck. It's in order to be able to control the dog better. And, uh, uh, and it has spikes. The, this is the prong, sorry. And the choke chain, it has spikes. So when he when you're gonna be pulling, it's gonna have spikes which are gonna get into the neck of the dog. And it's also gonna, it's a better way of controlling your dog. It's abuse, it's total abuse. Some trainers use it and they consider that, no, if you use it correctly, it's fine. It's not fine. I don't agree with it. I think it's abuse. It should never be used. So basically this trainer comes with his dog with a choke chain and a prong collar super proud of himself that his dog is like uh, very obedient. 
whereas I have a super hyper dog who's not listening to anything. And he was like, sit, 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 sit. So he basically choked the dog, I think seven times until the dog sat eventually. And while I was trying to educate him because some people do not know how bad this is, hence why awareness is so important. So I was explaining to him how bad this is and how it can actually lead to uh, an injury in the neck for the, uh, all of this. Um, he was telling me that, no, I only put it when I take him out because he doesn't listen. And during the rest of the day, the dog is put on a balcony, a big balcony all alone. And I look at him and I'm like, what do you mean all alone? He's like, yeah, I go, I leave work. I leave for work at 6 a.m. I come back at 7 p.m. The dog has a balcony. And I'm like, but you can't leave a dog alone for 12, 13 hours. He's like, no, no, don't worry. It's a big balcony so he can run. And he also has access to a garden. And I, I kind of lost it, I think. I always try to keep my calm with people like that because I'm not sure if they really don't know how bad that is or if they simply play dumb because they know how bad that is and they don't want anyone to come and poke around them. And this is where I was, you know, this is animal abuse. You shouldn't be doing that. I stayed calm. I explained to him everything. He was like, and I, and this is where I suggested if the dog is left alone for so long, so why don't you give him up? And he was shocked that I actually suggested this. He's like, would you take him? And I said, no, I can't. I already have dogs. I already have cats, but I'm sure we can find someone. And within two days, I actually found someone and the dog got adopted. We're going to be castrating the same dog tomorrow, actually, because the dog is super hyper. So we need to calm him down a bit. The owner immediately changed the choke chain. He has now a harness on. He's still very hyper. He's still scared of some people because the dog is not socialized correctly. But luckily, we were able to save this pet. Not all of them are that lucky, however. I still have some dogs who come in. Most of them, you can actually recognize them with time. You can actually, simply by looking at the dog, you will be able to say if he's been abused or not even when the owner lie. A lot of people come and they put harnesses on their dogs. And I'm like, do you hit your dog? No, never. And then you raise your hand and the dog pees on himself or the dog attacks or, or something. So you would know. And I remember I also have a client of mine who actually does not even know that I know. So uh, whenever he would bring his dog, I would know that the dog is anxious and I would know that the dog is abused and he would always refuse and say, no, and he treats it really well and he hugs him and everything until I caught him one day walking the dog with a prong collar. So cases like this are always gonna happen. Uh, NGOs are starting to work against this. In Lebanon, we have a law who's protecting animal abuse. So bit by bit, it's gonna get better. But the only way where we can have like complete the solution of the animal abuse is through awareness and explaining to people so hopefully, with time, this will decrease. Uh, thank you for sharing that story. We actually got a lot of follow-up questions regarding that. So the first being, how do we deal with hyperactivity in dogs? Um, it depends. So for this dog, he's a puppy. He's a puppy. He's a seven-month-old lab. So I have a huge dog who's super hyper. So basically, uh, we're going to castrate the dog because less testosterone mean, means less hyperactivity. Second thing is the dog is no longer gonna remain alone for 13 hours. Dogs are social animals. They need to interact with us. So the dog is in a better house. He's, gonna, he's having more human interaction. He's having more social interaction with other dogs. Third thing is you're, you have to walk your dog. You have to let his energy out. Dogs are domesticated wolves who used to run and hunt all day long. So if you're gonna be putting them in a house alone all day long, of course, they're gonna be hyper when you're gonna come back. So you should walk with your dog, run, your, run with your dog, make sure that your dog is getting all of this excess energy out of him, or you're gonna, if you don't do that, you're gonna have an aggressive dog and you're gonna have a dog who you're not gonna be able to stand and that you're gonna be having to give him up. So simple exercise, castration in, in case he's very, very hyper and socialization are the key into not having hyperactive. 
And of course, we should know that hyperactivity is also a character. So you could have a dog who's doing all of the above and still being hyperactive. And you could have a dog who's doing none of the above and he's really calm. So it depends also on the character. Good point. Um, following that question was what uh, someone was curious about, about castration. Um, mm -hmm. They were feeling guilty about castrating their dog because they're against uh, breeding. What, mm -hmm. Is there an alternative to castration? Okay, so this is a very common question that we get. Most uh, people who who ask me this question are actually guys who feel bad about castrating their pups because they think that they wouldn't let someone do this to themselves so they kind of have the same feeling i always tell them that and they also say that they don't want to go against nature so first thing first is that dogs should have been free running around in nature. We domesticated them and we decided to bring them into our home and extend their lifespan. So already we're changing kind of some part of their nature. The reason why you should castrate is that by practice, I see so many dogs with prostate hyperplasia, with testicular cancer, that it saddens me that this could have been avoided if we do a castration. So far, we haven't had any actual hormonal treatment which could be used as an alternative all of the hormonal treatment that we have are actually leading to cancer be it in females or males so the best recommendation so far is to do uh, to spay your dog or your cat but i'm pretty sure that down the line we might be able to find something better than doing a castration because as we all know castration or spaying leads to obesity also and sometimes urinary incontinence so i'm pretty sure that we're going to be finding a better solution but till now these are the best solutions that we have thanks um also what that case was um what should dog owners use instead of a choke chain what would you recommend for owners who with dogs who pull Uh, positive training for your dog. Work with a behaviorist who believes in positive training. If you can't afford the behaviorist, then go online. You have so many resources where you can simply type positive reinforcement for uh, training dogs on how not to pull a leash. And you will be able to do it. You just need to be patient with your dog. And But at the end of the tunnel, if you're patient, it's going to be beneficial for both you and your dog. And uh, you're going to have a dog who trusts you, who's not afraid of you, who's not abused, and who's happy with you. Because the reason why we have dogs with us or cats is to make us happy. And it's to make them happy as well. So positive reinforcement, always. always. Our next question is, do you as a vet always need to do tests to diagnose diseases for patients? For example, um, this person who asked this question said they have a cat who had been diagnosed with a fungus and then it turned to be contact dermatitis. So how could have this been avoided? Most of the time with practice, I think after five years of experience, you could detect 40% of the diseases uh, by practice. So if you have, for example, a dog who's vomiting, who's having diarrhea, you would know that he's having hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. If you have a dog who hasn't been eating for two days, you do an x-ray, you could know that he has gotten, he has eaten a foreign body. So you would be able to diagnose, but you are not allowed to make a final diagnosis without doing proper testing. There's a reason why we have machines to do blood tests. There's a reason why we have uh, x-rays to show us, why we have echography. So medicine is here to help us accurately diagnose. For me, this could have been avoided, avoided by simply doing a culture from the beginning. So whenever I have an owner who comes in with a skin issue, and I'm 99% sure that this is fungus, I always tell them this is most probably fungus, but we need to do a culture to confirm it. So using the tools that medicine has given us, because what we're using is not something that someone discovered two weeks ago. We're using actual instruments which have been discovered years ago. So we might as well benefit from them. We're lucky we have them. 
So we can avoid doing misdiagnosis by accurately using the instruments that we have and accurately diagnosing what's going on with your pet. Um, we have a couple of questions regarding uh, doing practice in the US. Uh, first being, did you have to take any exams in order to practice in the US since your veterinary degree is from the outside? Yes, so as a vet who took, who graduated from EU, so from Budapest, I should take an exam in case I wanna practice. And actually there are two places where I should take an exam in the UK and in the US. So if you graduate from, from anywhere in Europe, you will have to sit down for an exam before being uh, capable of practicing in the US or in the UK. Okay. Um, so right now, oh, are you able to move here to the US and still able to do your practice here? Or you'd have to take another exam, that's what you're saying? Yeah, this is, oh. we have to take an exam. As far as I know, I've never really asked into it. It's just what we've been told back at my university. I never thought of working in the US, so I never looked into it. But as far as I know, you should take an exam and have the equalization of your degree before, of your license before ca being capable of practicing in the US. And um, in the US, we hear a lot about depression among veterinarians. Is that an issue in Lebanon? In the US, US we think it comes a lot related to debt, depression, and verbal abuse from clients. Um, is that an issue in Lebanon? Uh, I think this is an issue everywhere uh, because as a vet, you have a lot of compassion and you care a lot about animals. A lot of people will abuse of your kindness, will bring you cases and will kind of force you to treat them for free. I myself have been a victim of this for a couple, a couple of times and then I decided to put a stop to this. So I help as much as I can. Uh, we're always trying our best to help as many as we can, but we should never be forced into doing something for free completely all the time. If I decide to do something for free, then it should be because I really feel like helping. If I can't afford doing something for free, then no one should make you feel bad about it. Because the same way that the person who brought you this stray dogs or their own dogs for that matter, and they can't afford treatment, you also would, you are not always capable of treating this dog or cat. So some people think that because we are vets, we want to save all of the animals. I wish I could save all of the pets. I wish I was capable of doing everything for free. Unfortunately, my father had to pay a lot of money for me to be capable of doing what I do and to have my own clinic and to help as many animals as I can. Till today, I still did not even have uh, all of the investment that he has done on me for my education paid back. So it's not, it's not fair for people to expect vets to do everything for free for them. I'm one of those vets who help as much as I can. I'm one of those vets who, have, who has been bullied into helping pets and who has actually helped because in the beginning, I did not know how to stand up for myself. But now I know when to say yes, for a rescue case and when to say, I'm sorry, I can't afford helping you, please try someone else. I also think that because uh, some people uh, want us to always be there available for them 24 seven, which is not always the case also. For example, I can't, I can't have emergencies in the clinic because I'm a single vet. I can't be working day shifts and night shifts. So in the beginning, it was also very harsh. And some of my clients also were expecting me to be present all the time for their dogs or their cats for that matter. So once you kind of established these boundaries, which is kind of hard, it gets easier. So the first couple of years are hard because no one teaches you how to set boundaries. No one teaches you that it's okay to say, no, I can't take on this emergency. It's okay to say, no, I'm too drained. I can't take on extra shift because we have so long hours sometimes. So when I first started, I was working between my work, my private clients, 10, 12 hours every day, which is too much. So, and I never knew how bad that is because I wanted to save everyone and I wanted to help everyone and I wanted to be the best vet I could do. So once you know how to set these boundaries and to say, to, and 
I think also one of the reasons why we go into depression is because we're all humans. We all make mistakes, especially in the beginning. And so some people are very harsh on us when we make mistakes. And this is where we feel like failures and we feel that this is too much. I'm pretty sure every vet has had a moment in his life where he thought that he's not good enough. Uh, this is that this is known as imposter syndrome, that he does not know enough that he is making too many mistakes. I know that I'm guilty of that, but we're always learning. We're always trying to make uh, our pets better. So with, I think as you mature, you know how to set boundaries and you know how to respect yourself, how to respect your family, how to respect your patients. And when you're taking care of yourself, then you can take care of the animals and not fall into the whole depression. Um, thanks for sharing that wonderful experience and how you set boundaries for yourself. Um, we've had a couple questions mm -hmm. back to um, what are your thoughts around some treatments? Um, first being, what are some dangers around feeding dogs human food like leftovers, pork products, as opposed to dog food? So I don't mind if you give your dog some home cooked food, as long as you know that if you're going to be giving them some home cooked food, then there's a list of items that you're not allowed to give them onions, grapes, raisins, uh, all of this. So you need to stick to this list where these are a big no no that you can give them. You need to know that you can give them spices, salt, sugar, all of this. So if you have, for example, I don't know, you cooked rice with meat and you have some leftovers and you want to give them to your dog, it's very important to make sure that they are cooked in a way that it's not harmful for your dog. So you can't have extra chili spices with the meat and give them to your dog. If you follow these few basic rules, then it's fine. But you should also know that once you start feeding your dog uh, cooked food, then it's very hard for him to eat dry food. So What's good about dry food is that it's very practical. It's very quick. You don't have to cook. It's time, time saving. So in case you feed him cooked food, which is very good, I have no problem against, against this, but you should know that you might not, you might have a stubborn dog who's not going to eat dry food in case one day you can't cook for him. So this is the only thing is be sure that this is something that you can be consistent with and that you can always cook for your dog and give him enough food in case one day you don't have enough food or you don't have time to cook for him, then you need to have a plan B for that. Great. Someone left in the comments as well. The ASPCA uh, Animal Poison Control Center has a great info on food to avoid with pets. Exactly. Um, Another question we had was, how much does it cost to do a culture and diagnostic test in general? It depends. So especially now, so I don't know how much it costs in the US. Everything costs much more in the US. I have a patient of mine now who's in the US who wants to do a CT scan, who told me that it's going to cost her around $4,000, whereas it costs $300 in Lebanon. So you have a huge difference in gap. When it comes to diagnostic, it depends on the lab you're using, it depends on the vet you're using, it depends on what you're testing. So price range is huge. I can't give an accurate, uh, accurate answer for that. That's a good point, yes. Um, how do you deal with dogs? How do you deal with dogs with social anxiety? So I had a dog who had social anxiety two months ago, I think. I was able to identify him. I spoke with the owner. He was a very cooperative owner. He told me that he did feel that his dog has anxiety. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the dog is comfortable in the clinic. So the first time he ever came into a, the clinic, he was shivering, he was barking, he had his tail under, he could not look me in the eye, everything. So what we decided on is that he would be bringing the dog every day to the clinic and we're going to be giving him treats. So I actually had a very consistent and persistent owner and he actually got him uh, around 10 times maybe to the clinic where he stayed with him. We gave him treat. We positively reinforced his uh, feeling uh, good in the clinic. And now we have a dog who's 
running in the clinic, barking, his tail up, his, uh, he's super confident now in the clinic. So this is something that you can work on with a behaviorist. I always try to make sure that my patients feel secure and safe in the clinic. And I'm lucky to be having some owners who are uh, uh, willing to put in all of that effort. And at the end, we have a healthy dog who's not anxious. So it's a win-win situation for everyone. Excellent uh, advice. Um, back to uh, kind of the mental health aspect of things. Uh, is there any opinion you have on why suicide rates are so high in the veterinarian professions other than people wanting vets to do things for free or being bullied by clients? Uh, it's also because most, if you, by nature, if you're a person who wants to become a vet, usually you should, but it's uh, very empirical that you're someone who's going to be liking animals. If you like animals, then you're an empath, empath by nature. So you feel with people and usually you feel the emotion much more in a stronger way than other people. Uh, and this is why I feel that vets uh, have very high standards for themselves and for their patient. And when they fail at something, they feel really bad and they feel the emotion in a bigger, in a harsher way than other people. Hence why you have so much depression. And because if you talk with people who do not, because I, for example, have friends who do not like animals. So if I come back from a very harsh day of work and I tell them I lost a patient, a lot of the answers that I might be getting is it's only a cat or it's only a dog. Don't give it that much thought. So also your emotions are rendered as if they are not valid. So my advice for this is to talk with a colleague of yours who is going through something similar or who has gone through something similar and to always remember that you're doing your best and that everyone makes mistake and setting boundaries again. Huh. Um. What would you recommend? I think there's just some students here looking for advice on some things in general. Uh, what would you recommend to a student majoring in farming instead of uh, pet animals in the sixth year to work in Lebanon? Sorry, okay. Could you ask that again? So if they wanna go into farming instead of pet animals in Lebanon, that was yeah, the question. Yeah, I think that's what the question's asking. <laughs> Okay, so basically in Lebanon, I think we have a, I don't think, we have a shortage in good vets for farms. We have quite a lot of farms. We do not have enough vets who are willing to go and visit these farms. And most farms are being treated by the herder actually, which is, which most of the time, because while, while I was doing my PhD, I discovered that. So because the herders do not have anyone who comes in or no one is willing to come, and get paid for his services. Uh, the herders are actually treating their own goats and cows by injecting them with antibiotics and hormones. So we do need uh, vets. If you like uh, large animals, then definitely go for it. Uh, never go for what is most, like you should always see what you need to do and what the market needs. But I think if you're going to be going into farming and you don't like large animals, then you're not going to succeed. And even if the, uh, for example, in Lebanon, we're kind of saturated for the pets, for the vets who are treating pets. But if you like it and you're good at it, you're going to succeed. I remember so many people were telling me not to open my own clinic because there are so many vets already. And I didn't listen to anyone and I opened my own clinic and it's working very, very, very well. So if you like it, go for it. That is excellent advice. Um, so other general questions people have about their own pets, it sounds like. Um, how, what could be some reasons why dogs are afraid of other dogs? It depends. So here you need to work with the behaviorist. It depends on where he was raised, how he was raised, with whom he was, if he had any sort of traumas if he was abused by other dogs. So all of these should be taken into consideration. And then once, I think the hardest part is figuring out what the cause of it. Once you figure out what the cause of it is, then the treatment is much easier, even if it's gonna take longer, but it's easier because you can see if he's improving or not, and you can change the treatment accordingly. Uh, 
Uh, another question around this was uh, if, oh, what could be some reasons why a pet might be leaving the house and if there's anything you can do to stop them from leaving the house? Leaving the house? Yeah. So this is, I think, these are mostly behavior questions. So I think a behaviorist would answer these better, but it depends on his character and it depends on his age and it depends on how he was raised. So a new puppy that you just got home is definitely going to leave the house because he doesn't know his perimeter and he doesn't know his owners and he doesn't know where he belongs. So once he has established all of these, a dog would go and discover, but he should come back because usually they are lawyers. Same goes for cats for that matter. Nice. Um, someone asked, uh, have you ever thought about going vegetarian or vegan? Oh yes, <laughs> several times. And I tried it and I'm still trying it. So now I very rarely eat meat. But I think um, this is something that uh, needs some discipline and it should also be done correctly. I also, I did it once for a couple of weeks and I had hormonal problems and I have skin issues. So I did it wrong. So I do believe that it can be done right. And I do believe that I will be able to do it uh, when the time is right for me because this is a big change. So on a personal level, I will be doing it. I'm not sure when, so we'll see. Thanks. Uh, and final question as we wrap up, any final advice to the med students, the veterinarian students who are in this call? Yeah, so basically I would say if you like it, go for it. But remember, so never give up, no matter what you're going to go through. Uh, it's always going to be hard. It's always going to have some obstacles. But uh, look at your goal. It's like, really, it's not just like words that you hear. And it's actual things that I've experienced through the sleepless night that I've had in my room alone in Budapest, where I was, I wanted to give up. Wanting to give up is so normal, especially when you're studying that much. But if you always take it one day at a time, think, okay, I'm gonna get it done today, study for today, see how it's gonna go tomorrow, because in 90 days, I might finish this course and then go on to the next. And then in a couple of years down the road, I'm gonna become a vet. So dividing it into small goals helps a lot. And eventually you're gonna make it. So always believe in yourself. I've had so many people who discouraged me and proving them wrong is so nice. So believe in yourself and take it one step at a time. Thank you so much. This um, concludes the Q&A portion of our that shadowing session today. Um, if we can, Dr. Tibet, if you could stop your screen share very quickly, I can yep, my wrap course. up presentation so our students can um, figure out how you guys can take your assessment. So if you guys are looking to get verifiable shadowing hours today with pre-health shadowing, you can take our post-shadowing assessment, which I will go into detail at the very end of this wrap-up presentation. Okay. Well, let me see how I can stop sharing. Okay. Done. Okay, awesome. And I can go ahead and reshare. There we go. So um, for my students, um, please go ahead and log into our website when you guys are doing your um, post shadowing assessment today, go ahead and leave a comment. Um, it, let us know if you resonated with any part of today's presentation, if you had any meaningful takeaways, or you have any feedback for pre health shadowing. And some general announcements. Um, you guys are welcome to join our team. We are currently taking applications. Um, and here is the QR code that you guys can scan with your telephone. You can also find this page on our website under the contact tab in the menu. Um, and there will be a short application uh, process and a meeting interview. And if you want to be a part of pre-health shadowing, but feel that you cannot commit the time to become a team member, no worries, we have a solution for you. We have volunteer opportunities, which can be done from the comfort of your home, on your computer, whatever time you want. So if that you have some free time right when you wake up, 
or maybe you have some free time around lunch, whenever you have time to fill it in, you can go ahead and do that. You can sign up to be a volunteer with Pre-Health Shadowing on our website at the URL below. Our Spotlight Student of the Session today is Sarah Hayes. Sarah was able to comment our last guest speaker's name all the way down without being interrupted. So congratulations, Sarah. Um, if you guys want to be more active uh, with pre-health shadowing, please repost our Instagram stories. We post a lot on Instagram with updated uh, speakers lists, um, with free opportunities, even if they're not with pre-health shadowing, any opportunities for students that we find, we like to repost them. So please do your part in helping um, promote diversity within the health field by sharing these free resources with students. Um, and it's greatly appreciated. Now I have a challenge for you all today. On our Instagram, we post updates of all of our shadowing sessions um, so that you guys can stay informed. Um, with today's challenge, I challenge all of you to go to Dr. Tebet's um, Instagram post on our Instagram at, at prehealthshadowing and comment her last name letter by letter in the comments. Your goal is to get from the T, the starting T to the ending T without being interrupted by another student and getting it in the correct order. Um, and so we will pick a student um, who can get all the way through it without interruption. So go ahead and try that. Um, good luck. <laughs> Our next shadowing session will be this week on Thursday, November 12th at 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, and we will be shadowing an anesthesiologist, um, Dr. Andre Pinsett. So don't forget to register for the session and we hope to see you all there. If you guys are looking to take the quiz, I will go into details about that now. So to get your certificate, you must go to our website on um, Dr. Tibet's course and click the free take this course button. Once you do that, you'll be led into the course module where you will be able to take the quiz. You will have 15 minutes to complete this quiz. Um, the quiz is not meant to be difficult. It's just meant to show that you were actively participating in this session and taking good notes. Um, once you pass the quiz, you must get a 70% or higher to be eligible to receive your certificate. Once you pass, you have to go back to the original page you were on, the speaker profile page, and click finish course in step four. If you do not hit finish course, you will not receive your certificate. So please be sure that you um, check for this if you don't see your certificate pop up in your profile. Once you complete this and you click finish course, your certificate will be downloadable immediately and you can find it always in your profile under the certificates tab. If you guys have any questions about this or experience any issues, feel free to reach out to us at info at prehealthshadowing.com and we'll be sure to get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you all today. This concludes our shadowing session with Dr. Myra Tibet. Thank you again for joining us. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, everyone. Nina, just one question. Is this going to be saved somewhere? Because some people are asking if they're going to be able to listen to this again so just wanted to know from you guys if you can yes so we actually record all of our shadowing sessions and we upload them to both our website and our youtube channel so um you guys can check back uh we usually have them up within 24 hours of the end time of the session okay. awesome so thank you all and you are also eligible to take the certificate um assessment even after uh, the session has ended um, a week from now, whenever you watch the video, you're eligible to take the um, certification. 